York, it's happening again, a chilling and alarming glimpse into the threat environment that prosecutors handling cases involving the ex-president are facing right now. In the federal indictment of a man who allegedly made threats to Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis and Fulton County Sheriff Patrick Labatt. Arthur Ray Hansen II was charged on Monday for making threats to Willis and Labatt back in August, just days before Willis charged Trump and 18 others in a sweeping RICO case alleging a, quote, criminal enterprise that sought to overturn the results of the 2020 election. New York Times reports this, quote, in a voicemail message for Sheriff Labatt, Mr. Hansen threatened the sheriff to not take a mugshot of, quote, my president, Donald Trump. That's according to the indictment. I'm warning you right now, Mr. Hansen said, adding that Sheriff Labatt could, quote, get hurt real bad. Mr. Hansen also left a voicemail message for Ms. Willis in which he threatened her and referred to the Georgia case. Quote, watch it when you're going to your car at night, when you're going into your house. Watch everywhere that you're going, Mr. Hansen said, according to court records. Quote, when you charge Trump on that fourth indictment, anytime you're alone, be looking over your shoulder. Willis and Labatt were undeterred. Clearly, Trump was charged. Trump was fingerprinted. Trump was booked. And Trump had his mugshot taken. But the threats have not receded. Take a listen to what Willis told the Fulton County Board of Commissioners earlier this month. And I want to talk about the threats, okay? So we... You all don't get to hear all of them. Unfortunately, I've now damaged probably some of your customer service personnel who does get to hear a fraction of them because people are threatening me in that way. But I have, in the last probably two months, over 150 threats that have come into the office. They come in through the customer service line. They come in through my phone line. They come into the magistrate court. They come in through written letter. They come in through text messages. The demands that I am putting on my staff right now to try to track down and investigate the threats, but also keep me alive, which has become a real concern for me. Um, I have got to have people that are loyal to me and that my life means something to happening all day, every day in this country. Just one prosecutor there talking about 150 threats in about eight weeks, during which the Fulton County case, along with Jack Smith's two federal cases against Donald Trump, have been proceeding. And all the while, the ex-president has reacted to every twist and turn in all those cases with a steady, undiminished stream of violent rhetoric directed at the prosecutors, at the witnesses, at the judges, at the court staff, you name it, everyone involved. And that conduct keeps happening despite a gag order put back in place by Judge Tanya Chutkin. Trump today slamming Jack Smith and Fonnie Willis as, quote, radical left thugs. The incessant violent rhetoric of one Donald Trump and his supporters posing a stress test for our very system of justice is where we begin today with some of our favorite experts and friends. Former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI, Frank Figluzzi is here. Plus, former lead investigator for the January 6th Select Committee, Tim Hafey is back. And the former chairman of the RNC, Michael Steele, is here. Michael Steele, I, I, I'm going to start with you today. Um, this ushering in of a permission structure for political violence is something that every elected Republican in Washington just about has been complicit in by not condemning the very first invocations of violence and enthusiasm for violence that Trump uttered as a candidate in 2015 and 2016. And I know that's ancient history, but you know from the violence that has occurred that the permission structure and the activating to go to Washington on January 6th. It happens in real time. The threats against Judge Chuckin, for which there was an arrest uh, earlier this fall, and in this case for DA Fonnie Willis and Sheriff Labatt, they're ongoing. They're on Trump's social media feed and from Trump's podiums at his events in real time. They could, the environment could improve at any moment should Republicans choose to improve it, and they don't. Why? Um, because they like it. They, they're okay with okay with it. Um, it fuels the, the the energy around the base that you know allows them to you know put a hundred dollars every month on their credit card. Um, that that will be there when it's time to turn out the vote. This is not about uh, the rule of law and the structures of institutions like the Department of Justice or even our local prosecutors and police departments. 
This is about how we politicize everything in order to get what we want, how we dehumanize individuals and threaten them to get what we want because I'm aggrieved, I'm put upon, uh, I'm disappointed, I'm mad, I'm angry. And when the political leadership um, stokes those flames, this is what you get, the, the random calls, the 150 calls into the prosecutor's office saying, you know, look over your shoulder. Because there's no one to say, don't do that. There are consequences for that behavior. There are political and legal consequences for that behavior. So even when the legal system, in the case of Ms. Willis, responds and brings charges, there's political silence. There's no, there's, I mean, you would think that would give these, these so-called leaders cover to then stand up and go, oh, yeah, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, we shouldn't be threatening our prosecutors. Because the flip side of this coin is it comes for you, too, at some point. Right. And, and, and you somehow think that because you're standing so close to the disease that you're not going to catch it. <laughs> well, you will. You know, it's going to come for you, too. And so uh, it's not surprising to see where we are right now, Nicole, with this, that our prosecutors, our election officials, our law enforcement officials are on their own when it comes to their to their uh, protection and to uh, their ability to do their jobs, because at least in one party, uh, that party has put a target on their backs. You know, Frank, I, I know that you, you've sort of helped educate and illuminate how you protect people targeted by someone with the size megaphone that Trump has. And it's about, I guess, staying left of boom, right? You, you stay, try to stay ahead of the threat before they're actualized. But in a domestic context, that hasn't worked. I mean, January 6th happens despite chatter and threats and very public incitement of an insurrection of exactly what happens. We live in a post-January 6th world, and it feels like we haven't made any adjustments or calibrations. Yeah, this is worth noting because, look, despite the message, and the message is clear, that if you are behind these threats, 150 at least, just for Fonnie Willis, you're going to jail. The, the federal government is going to put its force behind that investigation, as they did with the woman in Texas who left threatening voicemails for Judge Chutkin as they did when the FBI attempted to arrest the man in Provo, Utah, who threatened prosecutors and President Joe Biden and was forced to use deadly force when he reportedly swung a weapon toward the arresting agents. Now, as has been done with a man in Alabama. And, and despite that, this guy in Alabama and 150 other people, apparently, have said, yeah, that's OK. I get I get the FBI is taking me away in handcuffs, but I'm going to do it anyway. So we have to ask ourselves why. And I, I say this is a deep, deep level of radicalization. This is the kind of radicalization that you get when people have a devout religious fervor that they're willing to martyr themselves for. Now, this is turned on its side, and it's turned on to our justice system and the rule of law. There's nothing about valid legal illegal threats, I should say, unlawful threats, interstate communication of a threat. That is free speech. So I don't want to hear it from anyone who's saying, you know, they're arresting people for free speech. They're arresting people because a prosecutor has looked at the case and said this matches the statutory elements of interstate communication of a threat. Now, we'll figure that out in court, but this isn't looking good based on just what we know from this case. So when you have people willing to, to die, the guy in Utah, the guy who went into the FBI Cincinnati field office, you have people willing to go to federal prison destroy their lives, their careers, and their families for essentially one man and the deluded belief that somehow society is falling apart and we have to take back democracy. Um, this is where we are. I wish I had the solution. I wish I had the button to press to say, oh, this is how we're going to get out of this. But right now, it's looking, it's looking like this is going to can continue despite the threat of jail, federal prison, and ruination. People are doing this. Tim.